we've completed Nintendo Power's milestone 50th issue last month, and now it's time to look onwards with issue 51 for August of 1993. This issue, we have a fighting game going on its first big Super Nintendo revision, so let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Street Fighter 2 Turbo, with painted cover art featuring the now playable boss character of Vega. It probably featured Vega because, well, he looks kind of like Wolverine. That's why a lot of people I knew in high school and middle school played him. In the letters column, we have a letter from a long-haul truck driver who got so frustrated with Final Fantasy Legend that he nearly ran over his Game Boy with his rig. Fortunately, he was stopped by another trucker who had gotten past the same roadblock in the game with a little help from his kids and probably also Nintendo Power. Speaking of which, if you're a trucker who is watching the show, please let me know in the comments. And please don't watch the show while driving. Be safe. We have our first big home revision on the Super Nintendo for Street Fighter 2 with Street Fighter 2 Turbo. This isn't the first revised edition of the game to get a home port. That would be Champion Edition for the Genesis. Now, like Champion Edition... Turbo enables mirror matches out of the gate, along with having the four bosses be play playable characters with appropriate balance adjustments for the playable versions of these characters. However, what Turbo adds is a more adjustable game speed, and in particular the titular Turbo function. The game itself has write-ups for the new roster, and how they compare to each other. Well, the biggest addition to Street Fighter 2 Turbo, aside from the now playable and rebalanced bosses, is the speed. The first game felt very slow and deliberate compared to modern fighting games, which are very fast-paced, even Street Fighter V. If you watched EVO, or if you watched, well, um, Combo Breaker, you could just tap the, the wide comparison here. Now, Street Fighter II Turbo is very fast-paced. It's Closer to what's familiar with modern players, though not quite as fast-paced as what you expect now. There are still some mechanics which are absent that modern players will expect that are introduced in later games, but we'll see those in later iterations of this title. Particular note of the missing gameplay functionality is super moves. Still, the game is very fun, and I was able to get the hang of it much better than in the earlier version, in part because my muscle memory, which is familiar with faster fighting games, isn't working against me with the slower speed. Still, I wouldn't quite consider this the definitive version of Street Fighter 2 yet. The definitive version is still to come. Next up is Zombies Ate My Neighbors, a top-down run-and-gun game inspired by B-movies and published by Konami, but developed by LucasArts. The article provides maps and tips for, for a variety of stages, but not a bunch of stages directly in order, instead highlighting several of the game's different environments. Zombies Ate My Neighbors is a really fun game, with the player or players, since it supports two-player simultaneous play, having to navigate a variety of environments to rescue innocent bystanders. Mechanically, the game prioritizes rescue of survivors over killing enemies, as enemies respawn endlessly and it is impossible to advance until all survivors are rescued. Rescue with the game over happening if you lose all your lives, or the enemies kill all the survivors without you rescuing them. The game uses a password system to handle continuing the game over saves. However, you don't get checkpoints every level, which makes pacing play sessions tricky. Unfortunately, I don't have a second player to play with, so I can't speak for how well the game plays in two-player. There was an episode of Watch Out for Fireballs that covered the game as well and I believe they get into the multiplayer stuff, so I'll put a link to that in the show notes so you can listen to that. Still, if you can find a copy of Zombies Hit My Neighbors for the Super Nintendo, it is definitely worth picking up. We now have, at last, the Super Nintendo version of Alien 3, with a notes on a variety of the stages, along with a map of the prison and advice on what your first few missions should be. I should mention this game that the contest for this issue is to win a life-size statue of a xenomorph, the prop for Ripley's cryopod, a copy of the game, and, if you have parental permission, a copy of Alien 3 on VHS. That's kind of impressive. And in the case of the cryopod, considering I live in the vicinity or in the same general tri-state area 
as the Science Fiction Museum of Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame, which has, or at least had, the Queen Alien, I can reasonably say, when it comes to the cryopod, it belongs in the museum. Anyway, Alien 3 isn't exactly a Metroidvania, in the sense that you aren't picking up new abilities that allow you to traverse new areas of the environment and get past certain environmental obstacles. Instead, I'd say this is Pugsley's Scavenger Hunt done right. In Pugsley's Scavenger Hunt, you are tasked with exploring the Adams Family Mansion and performing a series of, of objectives, but with little guidance in where to go and the order in which to perform these tasks, or for that matter, without any access to an overall map of the mansion. Here, you, are, you have a series of missions that you can choose from, along with information on what the objectives are for that mission, and a level map that's available right out of the gate. The controls are also much better, with jumps that are just the right height. There's also the ability to shoot in eight directions, and just the right selection of weapons. Specifically, Ripley's duct taped together flamethrower and battle rifle from Aliens. What makes the game particularly interesting is that the world itself has a finite amount of health and ammo pickups throughout the world, and as you go through the game, you'll end up burning through, somewhat literally in the case of flamethrower fuel, those pickups. This leads to a sort of survival horror-esque level of planning. You have to plan your route to the game world, as you'll need to leave some of your ammunition and health resources for the diff more difficult late game. Next is Goof Troop, an action puzzle game with a gameplay style similar to Star Tropics. The article gives maps for almost the whole game. Goof Troop was a game that I reviewed back when I was doing this series as a bunch of prose articles, and when I played that game for review, I beat it. This game is a simple enough puzzle game requiring the player, playing as Goofy and Max, to navigate a series of rooms, solving puzzles in each one. These puzzles, with a handful of exceptions, require you to push a series of blocks to unlock the room's doors in a very Sokoban-esque fashion. Like the Adventures of Lolo series from Sokoban itself, the puzzles are limited to one screen, though a handful of puzzles require you to bring an item with you from a previous screen. Now, unlike the Adventures of Lolo series, there aren't really a lot of puzzles. I beat this game in a few hours, and I am by no means a speedrunner. It's not exactly a must-own, but it is one of those games where if I got it in a grab bag, I'd be very pleased to have it. Wrapping up Super Nintendo titles, we have Nigel Mansell's World Championship, a Formula One racing game, which is something we haven't had for a while. We get notes on the gameplay modes and maps of the tracks. The guide also gives notes on tuning your car, along with brief info on the NES and Game Boy ports. I'm going to focus for this review primarily on the Super Nintendo version and skip over the other two, since they're not really featured that prominently. This game plays incredibly well. The controls are really fluid, and while there are some issues with the difficulty scaling, I got a really good grasp of what I needed to do in order to succeed in the game, which is what I want from racing games. The camera perspective is nice, and while it doesn't provide the same field of view as something like Rad Racer, it gave me the right level of um, immersive perspective where I could reasonably judge where I was in the track at any one time and tell if anyone is close behind me. It was fun and made for a very good game experience. In the classified information column, we have a unlimited continue cheat for Super Double Dragon. Also, the Konami code works in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 and Batman Returns, and we have info on what it does. In the next installment of the Star Fox comic, we learn that the space stingrays that were attacking our heroes last time were being remote controlled by a still alive Andros who is now holding Slippy captive. Next up is the name of the game, which in addition to being a track by the Crystal Method, is also an article discussing games with similar names but which don't necessarily play the same, such as the Myriad Adams Family games, or games with slightly different names which do basically play the same, like the various Battletoads games. Moving on to Game Boy games, we have Speedy Gonzalez, a fast-paced game based focused on the Looney Tunes character. We have maps of several stages of the game. Speedy Gonzalez is, in a lot of ways, an attempt to make Sonic the Hedgehog on the Game Boy. It's a game about platforming while going fast. It even has springs you use to pick up speed, and loops you have to go through. 
it just has two fatal flaws. First, the music is incredibly underwhelming for the Game Boy, which, considering the sound hardware of the system, is kind of a big deal. Second, in Sonic, you have the opportunity to recover if you hit spikes or an enemy by dropping your rings, which you can in turn recover some of, and you have a way to strike back by jumping on enemies. Speedy Gonzalez has no counterattack, and if he hit, gets hit, he's dead. It's frustrating. With just a little bit of polish, this could have been the Sonic clone that Nintendo fans could have, could have held up in the face of the blue blur, but instead it falls short. Moving on, we have Star Trek The Next Generation from Spectrum Holobyte, which is something of an action-adventure simulation game and a port of the NES version, and we have notes on the game's first mission. So here's the problem with this game. Space combat is in three dimensions, like you'd expect. However, your radar on the game only shows your enemy's position in two dimensions, which makes it really easy for an enemy to outturn you so it can stay just out of your line of fire while still being able to blast you. Otherwise, conceptually, this could be a fun game, just not as immersive or comprehensive as something like Star Trek Bridge Commander, but it's still a fun way to pass the time. But the game requires space combat to proceed, and if I can't line up my shots, then it makes for a whole bunch of frustration. So, I'd say skip this game. Next up is the 4-in-1 Fun Pack, which wraps up our Game Boy coverage. This is a collection of four public domain or mostly public domain board games. Klondike Solitaire, Cribbage, Dominoes, and a generic version of Yahtzee. All these games have a very pronounced chance element to them, to enough of a degree that I'd say they're exclusively games of chance. So, basically evaluating these titles is based entirely on how well the games have, have their random number generator design, so I'm skipping this game. In Counselor's Corner, we have tips for Death Valley Rail, the Inindo, and Ultima 4, along with some additional stage maps for Star Fox. We only have two NES games this issue, starting off with the NES version of Jurassic Park, with maps of the first three stages and notes on the Game Boy version. The article says that the Game Boy version has better graphics, which might look all nice and crisp on the Super Game Boy, which I'd be using to capture gameplay footage, but which probably won't show up that well on the Game Boy's not backlit kind of fuzzy screen. I'm focusing on the NES version here. Well, we have another game by Ocean, the semi-bane of my existence. The game's controls are okay, navigating the environments aren't too hard, however where the game runs into issues is with enemies and with some of the environments themselves. The game, due to the slightly tilted camera perspective, causes situations where enemies can spawn in areas where you don't have a clear line of sight, and in turn this means that they can attack you before you have a chance to see them and thus evade them. The thing is, had this camera perspective been closer to, say, the camera angle of Legend of Zelda, top-down, instead of well, what is basically 15 degrees off from vertical, this game could have been considerably more playable. Instead, the game succeeds at just being very mediocre. Finally, we have our first adventure game in a while with King's Quest V, which is the first game in the series to get an NES version. The first King's Quest game got a port for the Master System, and the intermediary titles didn't get a console port at all. The article gives notes on some of the puzzles. This game is not particularly intuitive and fun to play, and the graphics and sound are pretty poor in comparison to the PC version. And to be clear, the issues here are not related to King's Quest V as a whole, it's related to playing this on an NES, to how the interface and how the game's control system and graphics are optimized for the NES, or rather, not really optimized very well. The game is just really bad in almost every respect in comparison to the PC version, which is available on GOG, so anyone and everyone can play it now pretty much on any system. Having seen Pushing Up Rose's review of the PC version of the game, the two versions are night and day from each other. If you don't believe me, I put a link to Rose's review in the show notes, which you should definitely check out. In the top 20 column, Super Mario World has been bumped off the top 5 slots for the Super NES, it's still in the top 10, but it says something about the library for the Super Nintendo, where there are a whole bunch of other titles, with some of them admittedly being other first-party titles, 
who can make a significant challenge to take the top spots from Nintendo's mascot. In the now playing column, of note among the also rans is Final Fight 2, First Samurai, and Alien vs. Predator, all for the Super Nintendo. And finally in the Pack Watch column, we have Clay Fighter and Star Trek The Next Generation for the Super Nintendo, Mega Man 4 for the NES, and Final Fantasy Legend 3 for the Game Boy. We also get a note that Final Fantasy Adventure 2 for the Super Nintendo has been retitled Secret of Mana. My pick for this issue is Zombies Ate My Neighbors. Street Fighter 2 Turbo is still good, but we're not at the definitive Super Nintendo version of the game yet. Alien 3 is really interesting as a sort of proto-survival horror game, though it falls more towards the Resident Evil 4 action-survival horror side of things as opposed to the Resident Evil 1 Sweet Home side of things. Next issue, we're going to learn that HD remakes, or at least up remakes, aren't as new as we think they are. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time. <laughs>